Hey folks, I am Rebecca, blonde in the belly of the beast, and I am here today with Morgoth, who likely needs no introduction. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, you're muted. Thank you very much for inviting <laughs> we've, we've kind of uh, known each other on and off for like years, going yeah. back a while, just, uh, but uh, it's the first time we've actually had a, had a chat together. Mm. I think it'll be really interesting. You've made a lot of excellent videos the last few months and years it's been really lovely to see you come into your own and your content is um so rich with with history and uh, with these ideas of the future and you do a really good job of balancing the despair that we're all feeling with um a little bit of hope a little bit of hope for the future so i do want to talk talk about that a lot if, if you're into it um, but you recently made a video uh, about the uh, Extinction Rebellion, oh. and I was surprised to hear you say that the last year has really changed your worldview. I've kind of seen you as something of a visionary over the last several years. So hearing you say, you know, I, I wasn't quite expecting this was something of a surprise. I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about the coronavirus agenda um, and how that's made clear the elite's intent to institute a social credit system uh, and was that something that surprised you yeah yeah it was because i what we i was one of the and i would say uh, quite a few uh, in sort of distant right circles who got kind of caught out because when when it first hit we 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 said we, like uh, me as well and we thought well this this is going to be uh, um this is going to be a problem for globalism because this kind of huge monstrosity that we've been fighting against and criticizing, it seems to be like, it seems invulnerable. It seems like you can just take anything and throw it at it and um, it, it comes through and it survives and it even gets stronger for it. But if you have a look at how the, the, like the virus, then all of a sudden the things that make, globalism globalization strong which is the mass movement of people and goods and services and whatnot all of a sudden this was that was like the conduit through which this supposed deadly virus actually went through and so it, it was as if all of the arteries were being clogged and we thought well how how are they what are they going to do here they're going to have to close the borders and and this kind of thing and there was like the hysterics around it was so extreme that you, you you really did expect so many people to die. But at the time, I was getting a lot of arguments with, I mean, let's just say conspiracy theorists or I don't know what they like to call themselves, truthers, whatever you want. And they were they were pointing out like, no, 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 it's it's not, it's not what you think it is. It isn't at all. And what I what I understood was that there's been there's a whole other kind of section of people who weren't as fixated on the particular groups, uh, let's say, and, and financial interests that, that sort of we were. And they were they had been studying things like the UN Agenda 2030 um, and the Great Reset, the Great Financial Reset and automation. So, And it was as if all of a sudden there was this other kind of thing emerging um, which which we, we didn't seem to know anything about because we, we'd been looking at, you know, the standard things like who owns the Federal Reserve, who owns Hollywood, who, who, who you know, the you-know-whos. And, and it, it's it kind of, as, as, it, as it played out, and then I thought, okay, I mean, there's a deeper problem, I think, this exposed, which is um, in the sort of the age of the internet, how do you know what's true and what isn't? And, and because if you're going to begin with the principle of well the mainstream media is just all bullshit that's okay that's true but then how do you know what is true because everybody's got their own theory and everybody's and there was a hell of a lot of confusion but then eventually when i began to see the masks being rolled out and like just the the the, the people just weren't weren't dying that much um then then i began to think well hang on a minute that there, there, there's something not right here um, and I began, uh, slowly but surely, it began to dawn on us that there's something else happening here. Mm -hmm. And um, and it, it took me a while to catch up, and I was like, yeah, I do it like this. When they began to mention vaccine passports um, and all of this, then I, I began to take a lot more notice. But it, it kind of coincided with an, another kind of uh, view that I had, 
which is like I'm I'm like a huge fan of Oswald Spengler. And you know, he did like the fall and decline of the West. And when you get into the late stage um of, of Western civilization, it, I began to realize that he, he was right again because he, he towards the end he gets in about how the, the sort of the Faustian spirit of always going into the infinite and the unknown. Um then eventually this is gonna be like a sort of the creation, like Western civilization is in a way destined to have this all-encompassing kind of shell around the planet because it doesn't know when to begin, uh, when, when to stop. And I began to see these kind of elements in it and these this kind of the, the thinking, and, and I began to get interested in the like the mentality behind this emerging technocracy. But it, but it, it, is, it is weird because it doesn't seem to line up with so much of the other kind of talking points. Um thinking that we do what's that oh i had lost you for a second you're okay yeah i was just saying it, it doesn't seem to line up with so much of the usual sort of talking points that we get into but yeah if you when one once you get it it kind of does that's true and I, you mentioned in one of your videos that uh we're we're witnessing postmodernism run a natural course and and you mentioned uh being stoic and i hear this a lot from people on the right and to some degree I do agree because we have to continue to live our lives in the best mental state possible. But I also feel like stoicism is something of a betrayal uh, to our ancestors in that we're watching postmodernism consume society as as bystanders. Um, do you think that those are are at odds, like that the fighting Western spirit and then adopting stoicism as something of a coping mechanism? It's it's it depends on whether or not you think of of Western civilization if it can be saved or if it's a natural cycle. Uh, if 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 there is um, if if there's a sort of if you think of it like a tree and it, it grows, it plants, and then it, it finds its soil. And then it flourishes in its springtime, and it extends itself through the earth, and it be, it finds its form, and then eventually it becomes like a mature tree, and it calcifies, and then begins to fall apart. So it, it depends if you, if you have a cyclical view of, of history, then in in that way it's this is all sort of destiny. And I know that sounds terrible, but then it's kind of like well, okay, if it is. Um, then what do you do about it? And it's you'll hear things from people like, say, Julius Evola, and he coined the term ride the tiger. And it's basically where you have to sort of hunker down and prepare because when this the, when this civilization hits the skids, it's gonna it's gonna hit it hard, and it's gonna hit the, it's 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 gonna make a big noise, and it's yeah. gonna it's gonna be have a, that's gonna be a lot of collateral. Or you can. Um, have the take well you dig in and then you try to uh, turn it around but the the thing is i mean you know something like to, uh, so many of the things that are a problem are sort of a natural outcome of western civilization like technology would be one of them i, I what, what do you do about some of these technologies and and how, how does that affect how we live on a day-to-day -day kind yeah, of exactly I, I, so you'll see somebody will have a take like, well, we need like a kind of European wide empire, um, you know, that kind of thing. But, but like then you've, you've got the question of taking this entire system on. And it isn't just a matter of voting like the, the next Donald Trump in or whatever, because you've got I mean, if, if you look at like Bill Gates and you look at these all of these multitudes of NGOs, they are actually what run the world. And, and I, you can't vote them out. I think that's definitely true. I mean, do you, do you see a future for Westerners where we could, in some even some small way, resurrect the ideals of Western culture while enacting some safeguards to ensure that it's not overtaken by progressivism again? Or is the technocracy, would it just reinvent itself and continue to overtake the culture? Well, it, it comes down to power. Um, mm. And the... They don't want us to have any power. They don't want us to have things on course. They want things to go the way they are. So, the, at the end of the day, I, I think I know this is like really too mongering and pessimistic, but I just don't see what you can do. What you can do is to try and um, 
get out, get get out of the system. So this is kind of like what I've been more interested in over the last year. How how it's all very well to say something like ride the tiger, but how how does how do you actually do that? How do you because especially like in the age of if where everybody's hooked up to the internet all of the time, um, and then and then there's the the, the unpopular one is just physical safety. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you see, like, say, these urban youths. Just yesterday I saw this video of, of, a, of a white couple in Chicago being dragged out of their car. Oh, yeah. And, and you think, so what, how is it, like, so it's all very well saying, like, we've just got to run to the woods, but how do you actually just prevent this kind of barbarism? And I think that, that kind of barbarism. To be fair, they were Puerto Rican, if that changes anything. Which the whites were. Yeah, I thought they were white. They turned out to be Puerto Rican. Well, so it might have been some gang <laughs> warfare nonsense. Right. Okay. Well, you know, have you, you got to be, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Is everybody, <laughs> everybody in the chat's like, phew. But, um, <laughs> yeah, really. it's, that being said, I mean, it happens all the time. We just saw this um, case of uh, that little boy. I think his name was Cash, who was taken out of his bed by a black teenager and, and just murdered in the street. Uh, and that was just a, a, a month or two ago. And then we see things like this all the time. So, yeah. So, I mean, it, it is this steady encroachment of, of mm -hmm. like barbarism. And it, again, it is, it, all, it is all of this like breaking, break down, I think. Um, and, and one of the things about um, where they're going with the technocracy is where you're hooked up to the internet and everything's automated. That it that could actually be in a way like mitigate some of the, the disastrous sort of ethnic problems. Because what it seems to be is that everybody, I mean, they're actually they're, they're actually going for transhumanism. <laughs> and, uh, like, and you see that the British government, this week the British government, it's on the government's website, and they've just accepted, so as a fact, that within the next 10 years or so, we're going to be like interfacing with, um, we're going to have like chips in our brains and we will essentially be looking at the internet. You know, we, we, we will just be literally, our minds and internet will be like merged together. Um, and, and so that this, all of this technology is bound up with things like the, the ID passports and all of this. So th this is like this is where they're going. This is where you, they want you to go, and and it, it kind of um, <coughs> it is consistent with the rest of it because first they would say, well, race doesn't matter. Everybody is just sort of we're all just human, and then it moved on, and it was like, well, um, it, do it doesn't matter about your sexual what whatever sex you are, whatever floats your boat, and then they went on further and said, well, it doesn't matter. Men can be women, women can be men. <laughs> And so where it seems to be going is that eventually it's just that your consciousness will just float around in cyberspace. What a horrifying prospect. <laughs> I can't even imagine how terrible that would be. And, and there's there's a like big money behind all of this stuff. Um, and again, this is why I, I go back to the, the sort of Spangler kind of take because that that is that is like the logical conclusion. That's, that is like the, the Western sort of man you know he travels over the endless spaces uh, of the seas and across the mountains you see that picture of like the caspar david friedrich uh, painting of the man look standing on the mountain looking into the endless horizon and everybody likes that everybody likes that kind of that faustian western man sort of metaphysic and aesthetic but there is a, like a downside to it as well and it's that if you can like look at something like cyberspace where you ju you then have this need to just dis just sort of dis disembody your your consciousness and go into the internet, and people will say, well, why why um why don't we go into space anymore? Why haven't we colonized Mars? And I, I, there's a there's a kind of a point to be made that um well we're going into cyberspace instead. That's the next frontier. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, so what do you do with uh, your anger, with your energy, if you don't have a lot of hope that we're going to be able to resurrect uh, a culture that we see fit to to live within? Because I, I just, uh, I, I, I don't want to bring up stoicism too much, but it seems like that is your coping mechanism for the for the world around you. And I am just seething all the time. And I'm like, what do I do 
with this angle. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I do, I'm, like I said, I mentioned stoicism on one video um, about uh, like because I, I didn't I didn't know how to end it because you're in this mode where you're in a constant sort of black pill and you're like, well, what is what is the answer to all of this? And I, I don't know what it is. Um, and, and, and other other than to say, buckle up. Um, and <laughs> right. like, you know what I mean? Like, well, that's not what I wanted to hear. Damn it. <laughs> it's, it's, there, there, is, there is this need that I think more, more than stoicism, people want um, like catharsis. Yeah, uh, and they they want this kind of um, feeling where okay, it was a bad, it was a rocky patch, but it, it it's over now. And and in the end of the day, the only way um, you can do that is by disconnecting from the system as much as possible. And what's funny is that when you look at the um, the sort of the great reset stuff and the automation, one of the reasons why I think it's interesting is because. They 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 want everybody vaccinated, and that's like the first step towards the the ID passports. Um, and then you, you, like that'll be a digital ID. So then you, you, it's kind of like you're going to be on the system and being monitored all of the time. And but the problem they had was getting from like people from let's say meat space into um, cyber space and having that plank. And that's what the digital ID passport is. And so what they've estimated, which I think is interesting, is that there will be 20% of the people of the population who just flatly refuse to go along with this. Only and, 20%. Uh, yeah. I mean, there, there's that, actually some of the figures that I've seen are like, um, it's like 46% of the, the British public. We're under this relentless propaganda mm. of just haven't had the vaccine yet. So there's a bit of a panic on, but I think by the government that this is this isn't going to go as easy as they can. Um, but anyway, so the 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 twenty percent is like, well, they they're going to start, and this is where you can begin to get a bit of a white pill, I think, because that means that they're going to be sort of ostracised from mainstream society unless they you know don't just buckle. If if all of this comes in. But it it's it does look like it is. Um, th then you're going to have like the sort of economics, and I think it's like they're going to be um, living a more natural life. But mm. but 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 one one of the things that people have to accept, I think, is that even even like say in a if there was like a nationalist government and you turned on global homo and, and neoliberalism, we have to accept that. Like you can't expect the same amount of material goods as what we've had for the last twenty or thirty mm -hmm. years. There will um, be some scarcity, obviously. Uh, yeah. I want to take a step back for those of my audience that are not familiar with your catalog. I know you've explained this at length on your channel, and everybody should check out his, especially his most recent videos. Um, but could you explain a little bit for people that are it's still coming into into clarity for them? Uh, how did the elite manage to mobilize? the middle class to to virtually wage war on itself using coronavirus well <clears throat> one of the things if you go back if you think of like the average shit lib lefty like they just 10 years ago they were and you go back a little bit further um they were if you think of occupy wall street that was a that was like a genuine anti-elite kind of movement and you can see there's a definite turn in around about 2010, 2011. And you can go on that thing that on Google where you can see words used over time. Right. You can see that after Occupy Wall Street, which was all about against Wall Street, obviously, the big banks and stuff. <coughs> and what they were um, after that point, you can see in all of the major newspapers across uh, Britain and America is that words such as uh, racism, white privilege, um, all of this, it all just skyrockets. Mm. All of the SJW language comes in. And what they were doing was um, acting like a, you know, like a, a matador with a bull. And we, we, we white people were the cape and the lefties were the bull. Mm. And it was like, don't come after us, go after the structural racism and all of this. I'll just get a drink of water. I've got to. Aye, aye. <clears throat> um, wanna... so what the what the elites uh, learned to do was to sort of 
you use us as a sort of, you know, as a carrot um, to get them to go after us instead. And you can see all of these terms in the press went through the roof after Occupy Wall Street. And then, so when it comes to the COVID, they've by this time, they've got them, they, they've got them hook, line, and sinker because all they need to do is reframe it to say that, well, the people who are anti-vaccination, they're the Trump supporters, mm -hmm. they're stupid rural idiots because we've had this whole culture war. So it's the people who aren't very well educated, they're conspiracy theorists, they're Trump voters. They In Britain, it'll be the gammons, as they call them, who voted for Brexit. So they've already got this convenient scapegoat that they sick them on. But behind the actual government, there's, they've been building these NGOs for decades now. So in the case of uh, the British government, the Dominic Cummings did a sort of conference a few weeks ago because I was interested in how this happened when it came in. And how, how it operated was that the British government were, didn't really know what to do and what had already been built by people like Bill Gates, the, the foundation, the IMF, the World Economic Forum, the World Health Organization, and all these different NGOs, they had all of this game plan worked out. So then when the COVID hit, they also had people embedded. I mean, it, it isn't even that conspiratorial because this is just what NGOs do. Mm -hmm. so, so then Dominic Cummins in this interview turned around and said it was Bill Gates who stepped in and said, this is what you need to do. And so then they just went with that game plan that already existed. Right, right. Uh, do you think that we're, we were naive to buy into populism? You mentioned this in one of your videos as well. Um, I, I, I look at some of my old videos, like I watched one I made in 2016 about Trump, and I was just brimming with optimism. And now I look back and I'm like, wow, how stupid, like how stupid were we? We were so deep into this cultural rot that the idea that some some multinational billionaire is going to bail us out of in-stage civilization is just preposterous to me. So was this a movement based entirely on a dejected populace making a last ditch effort to save a fallen culture? Or was there more substance to it um, that can be used against uh, what you're referring to this, the great reset and, and Bill Gates and the like? Well, I think it's, it's I think, to be honest, I think that's one of the reasons why they were desperate to get rid of Trump. Because I think I think they found themselves with this big clown, this 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 big <laughs> loudmouth clown, as a <laughs> right. and, and on, on some on some sort of issues, he was like totally weak, and he was out of his depth, and he didn't know what he was doing. But the problem is, there's a chance he could like really fuck it all up as well. If, if you know what I mean. Um, and so I think I think they did want rid of him to to sort of get this in to um, to, to, to to you know to to grease the wheels a little bit. I think he was just a big pain in the ass uh, for them, it, it, uh, even if he wasn't that much of an obstacle. But the the populism in general, um, I, I kind of uh, it's sad, but because on a deeper level, it is like you've got all of these people who are pissed off from the. From the rural areas, in because in in Britain and America there was a lot of similarities. It was mainly working class white people who had had enough of being shot on, had enough of mass immigration, had enough of uh, political correctness, all of this kind of stuff. And so it it kind of it, in that way I'll always like it'll always have a, a soft soft spot for it. But, you know, then afterwards, people have done more cold analysis of it. And they did it before as well. And they said that um, they basically it, it's a really terrible way to approach power. Mm. It, is this idea that you're going to red pill all the normies and um, <laughs> get this, 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 the game plan. And, you know, we can laugh. It's just the, the, the game plan is to red pill as many normies as you can and then have this like huge ocean of pissed off people to vote somebody based into office who's going to be like the new Napoleon and solve all that. <laughs> and then it's like, it, it is a nice plan, but the, the, pro the problem is the, the center of power will just crush it. Mm, that's true. It, 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 like, it, it's, it's an unfortunate truth that all, all um, rebellions, all revolutions come from above. 
Well, uh, I know that you said you don't have any answers, but uh, what do we do? What do we do now? What do we do? Tell us what to do, Morgoth. That's why I had you on. You need to give advice to all of us. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't, in terms of leading a popular revolution, I just don't. Oh, me dogs, me dogs, me dogs heard all this a thousand times. <laughs> but I am. Um, I, I I just don't see a, a point of politics anymore because even the politicians have even the politicians like are, are now subject to the all of these, this higher power, right? I, mean, right. I, I think I think there is a point where you just have to what do they, they call it like take the grill pill or to just uh, enjoy your life. <laughs> but as as far as uh, what 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 it was in 2016, 2017, I just can't possibly see anything like that happening because I mean, it, I, it, do you believe that? Um, Trump won the last election, or do you think it was robbed? I I think that there was definitely some election meddling, um, but I'm not sure that it really matters because there's election meddling in, in every election, and the American people seem to think, especially these these Trump folk, that this is the first time that an election has ever been meddled with. And I think that for the most part, having Biden as president. Um, it's hilarious to me because he clearly has dementia. He doesn't know what's going on. We're a joke on the world stage. And I have become something of a collapsitarian because it's very mentally exhausting and frustrating for me to live in this, in this in stage culture where um, we're not moving towards the end in any meaningful way. It's like, it, it, it just, it's taking forever. I know that my, my life has been short and everything like that, but it's just frustrating. Like I have this anticipatory anxiety all the time. Like, when's it going to happen? What's going to happen? And coronavirus came out of left field and everything. But now that the election has happened, um, I think that the, the normie American is kind of seeing like, wow, we are a joke as a nation. And that, that must be good. And it must be good that we're a joke on the world stage too. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah, it is. It is kind of an awkward point because you're American, and I'm going to guess most of the people in the chat are. But like, it is. It is America. Like, um, America. It's like having this big retard kid running around the world with a machine gun. <laughs> it's like, you, you know that. What? What? What's that? What's that book? Is it, uh, the one where uh, Lenny? Have, oh my gosh. Lenny. And it, it's like you've got it's that's like America is like the big retard kid yeah. in that. and you see you see it just everywhere like rainbow flags. <laughs> I, I'm I'm out in rural like northeastern England, even in England where I live has been forgotten about. So like I'm 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 right out in the outskirts here. So I don't you know the the people who can change things are in the center of American power. Um, but but yeah, it's it's just the whole the whole system. I view as just being a monstrosity, but in a way, in a way, that is like a kind of thing where if you can't, here's the problem that I've got, because that you know we get back to that that couple. Um, let's just pretend they were white. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like you get you get there's a because there's a tendency to say well, okay, well I'm just gonna go on the internet for an hour a day. I'm gonna just live in the real world. I'm not going to get upset about this stuff anymore and I'm going to live my own life. And that's perfectly fine. But the, the because you, it's, it's all of this like misery porn that you see on the internet, you know, like people being shot and things and, and because of like diversity killings. But then like, so you can disconnect yourself from all of that. But the thing is like the people are really dying. Like mm -hmm. it, things, things are getting wild out there. So it, it's it's like then you're kind of hiding from it, and I, and and the, that the, that's a, a problem with technology. Like mm -hmm. just the sheer amount of information that we we absorb every day is is just the hu the human brain isn't meant for it. We yeah we were never meant to travel so extensively to have so much knowledge about other cultures and the world. It, we were never meant to have access to this much much information. And then I hear this uh, all the time in the right: like, more information is always better. That's so stupid. Why? Why we don't need all this information? I don't need to know what's going on at all times everywhere in the world. It's it's bad for everybody's mental health um and you made an excellent video about nostalgia and how it's retarded the progression of history that's such an interesting point to me um which is essentially stopped history in its tracks yeah. we have unlimited access to previous cultural influences and in music and and film um do you see a way this can be disrupted and we can begin to make our own history again 
while we all have internet access. Yeah, I do. I, th I think so. The yeah, I'm, I'm going to say something positive. This is the, <laughs> the, 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 what one thing we can do is um, if you think of it, like we are in cultural exile. Mm. We, you know, we 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 tried to storm the gates. We tried to rebel, and they won. And it's like they've they've fobbed us off. We're cast into the wilderness, politically speaking. And what you? <laughs> Why can am do I laughing? That's so grim. <laughs> But, but but the the but it's actually for you see to be it's actually good for like in creative terms because you think well in a way I don't have to worry about it we we tried it and it didn't work and maybe yeah. we underestimated the 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 scale of the power and, and all of this kind of thing but you know like it, we were also doing it using the forms of the system itself. So, you know, and one of the things I did a, a recent video was on, on Lord of the Rings, and I see all of these people like on the internet, all these big YouTube channels endlessly complaining because uh, Star Wars and all of these different things, they're all cooked. Um, it's all gay. We hate it. And I think, why don't you like, why don't you like make your own? You know, mm -hmm. we, we've got the internet. You, why not write books? Why why not? Why aren't we, with all this technology, like, why aren't we making, like, cool movies for ourselves? And we, we, where you, you don't have to worry about, um, you know, you don't have to worry about the mainstream. Where, and, and so it be, what, what you're trying to get back is authenticity, which is robbed, which the, the, the capitalist system, uh, you know, the, the global homo and technology, it makes things inauthentic. But you can actually do, you can actually make your own, which I've been discussing a, a little bit more recently with people like the distributors and, um, and these kinds of people. And so, so you know, you, you, what you then build is a sort of a, a genuine culture. Right. Right. I think people lack creativity because they're wallowing in despair. And then we, we live in such a hedonistic culture um, without the promise of a future. And so that really does zap people's energy it's really hard to be creative when like you're hung over all the time and stuff yeah. <laughs> i think that that has something to do with it um i hope that our grief manifests in some some newfound creativity and i think that we will kind of see that but i'm disappointed in the ability of the right to do that um we do have murdoch murdoch though but I, why don't we see more of that well i think because one of the the things um is is that they make it specifically political Mm. And, and it's like you know, it's like um, the, you know that uh, the, the the Star Wars where it's like the Phantom Menace, and you've got like this as this kind of greasy little merchant kind of alien, and he's got this huge kind of like beak and, and this huge nose hanging down and a little fat belly, and and like and then you've got like some kind of big dumb thing which is just smashing the place up, and like so everybody, I mean, people will make like cultural like. They'll make fiction, and they've got all these obvious archetypes in, and, and I think that's something to be avoided. Right. In a way, it, it's just reacting uh, to, to the main, like the main culture, and instead, what you have to do is to go way back and and kind of look a look in, in things from a, a completely different perspective. I mean, one of the the earlier videos that I did, because sometimes I'll just wander around with the phone and do like a video off the cuff. And I found a, it's one of still one of my favorite videos. And I, I went, I was out walking in the woods, and what I saw was there was like a little waterfall, and there was a path going through the woods. And that what I what I liked was that they there would have been the council who built the path, and they deliberately did it so that it went. They had to like bore through rock, and then build a proper bridge just so that when you were on your walk. You could walk past the waterfall, so you you got you got. They could have just built it straight along the bottom of the riverbank, but they actually put like an extra two weeks work in just so people could walk closer to the waterfall. And it was just a little pathetic waterfall as well, by the way. But but uh, the point of it is, like, why do that? You know, if if everything is just purely like utilitarian and it's all about efficiency, it's about uh, saving money. Uh, like why bother building that path at all? What 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 purpose does that serve? Like what why you got you can go all the way back and ask yourself like at the end of the day why do you want to walk past why do you want to walk through the woods and why why is it then so important 
that you they'll put all of this effort in so you can walk past the waterfall. Mm -hmm. And it's you, it's weird because you you kind of take it for granted, but then when you sit back and you think, well, yeah, why is that? What 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 is nice about walking through the woods exactly? Like, and and people will try and come up with these like materialist kind of things about, well, the the I got, like, the air clears my head and this kind of thing. But I think it's something. I think it's something deeper than that, and and that's that's where you you need to go. But all of this is is kind of in opposition to the the main system itself, where everything runs on profit and efficiency. Mm. Everything's broken down on the spreadsheets and data and quantified. And it's what we have to do is go so far, like so deep, that this kind of purely rationalistic, mechanistic mindset. It, that's the problem. And so you, what, what the sort of being out in the wilderness as outcasts, it allows us to take a breather and take a step back and understand like the, the real problems and then begin to search for authenticity again, at least if you unlock that. And, and this is a sort of flow of civilizations where the, the, the people do begin to just go back to land because right. the, the system, it's, it's, it's not the... You know, people will say like the the people are decayed, the people are degenerate, and I think that's a more of a reflection of the system and a complete lack of spirituality. Right, right. But do people really have to go that deep and that far back to to find something that's so innate to us, which is the search for beauty? I mean, there there wouldn't need to be so much propaganda and so much programming to undo that if it wasn't so um, central to who we are. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it is that, I mean, it's so even sort of uh, like latently it's still there, you know, I did a video a few years back where there was this huge in classic FM in London, like the most liberal paused city you could ever imagine. And the, the classic FM, their numbers were going through the roof. Like there was an insane amount of people that started listening to Classic FM. And it just so happened that um, all of the, the people tuning in, well, we don't know. They, they left that out. But my intuition was they would all be white European people. And the reason for this is because the mainstream um, radio stations were all going like extremely diverse. Mm. It was more rap music. It was more of this filthy degenerate stuff. And so that when I when I was thinking about doing the video, I know what people will say. They'll say, "Are they then all on the road to being red pilled? Are they, or is it that they're turning more right wing?" And I don't. I think it goes deeper than that. I think it goes deeper than the politics of the day, and that the people who are tuning in and boosting Classic FM's numbers, they, they're kind of following a deeper drive and a deeper instinct as Europeans. There's something touching on them. There's there's a the the, the Classic FM what they hear on there is a form which is kind of, you know, they would like to try and universalize it. They'd say, well, it isn't just for us. But, you know, when you look at the demographics, it actually is just us who, who are interested in it. And so they were probably, this is the funny thing, they were probably like liberals. <laughs> right. they, 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 but, but they are yet, without knowing it, they're kind of, they're drawn back to a specific sort of form and a, a kind of expression which is of them and for them. We, we, so they, they can't escape what they are. Exactly, exactly. And we've seen that progression in art to, um, from, from realism to impressionism. And then we get, we get cubism and, and ab the, the abstract era. And now we're seeing this resurgence of, um, of hyper-realism in, in the art world. And I think that's so interesting that it's circled back around to an, an even more basic level of artistry than the realism that we saw like in the medieval period and things like that, or the Renaissance rather. Um, and I think that that's kind of emblematic of the culture, isn't it? That people are, are searching for what is the the most essential element of the reality that they see. Um, and I'm glad to see that, to see this rejection of things that are, that are ugly or, and don't make sense. And I think that this return to classical music as well is probably similar. I mean, we, we saw Copeland and all this dissonant music and everything like that. And people just acting like they understood it or like it sounded good to them. Jazz is kind of the same way. Um, and so I'm happy to see people really return to the the origin of, of all of this beauty. Mm. <clears throat>
Because because they're staring into the abyss now, right? <laughs> well, it's, it, my love. Yeah, it's totally it, true. It, it, it's like they're staring into the abyss, and all they see is like mm -hmm. you know somebody, some some Afro uh, youth like twerking uh, and like just right. gyrating around and dancing on dancing on car roofs, uh, and it's like um, you know throwing things around in McDonald's or, or just all of everything's just rotten and decayed, mm -hmm. and it's like there's this thing where you, you turn around and it's, you, you, you want to go back. You're always looking back into the past. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 it gets back to the nostalgia thing mm -hmm. where like – it, it the amount of nostalgia in Western culture at the moment it isn't healthy. I remember when I first started to bring this up, and people would say, um, "Well, you know, the people in the the, the sixties they look back at the thirties with nostalgia, and it's basically it's always been the case." And I think that's true to an extent, but not to the the, uh, the extent where we where we are basically just living in the year two thousand. Or 2001, like forever. We've been living. It's just been a, like a year of 20 years. Yeah. It's, been, it, it's it ha, it, like 2001 never really ended. Nothing really changed. New, no new forms. I mean, you know, I know it's like a cliche to say it, but what what is like the musical style of 2007? You know? <laughs> It, it, is that a rhetorical it, question? Because I don't even know how to answer that. <laughs> even 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 in the eighties, you can see that you had the kind of post punk, um, and then you got into the synth stuff in the early eighties, the new romantics, and then things the synth kind of became a bit more poppy. You had then you had the more Manchester scene. You got the Smiths arriving, yeah, New Order. You, you got all of the. You, you can kind of go through it, you know. And then you got the big kind of stadium rock stuff coming in at the end. And you can pick out these different eras just in the nineteen eighties and say, "Well, this belongs there, and that belongs there." How can you do that with the two thousand and ten? <laughs> because everybody uses the same like beats, and I, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I, I'm sure it'll emerge as some kind of distinct but garbage and the, uh, era all, of music. Yeah, they're all referencing each other. They're, it's all yeah. it's all clips of clips of clips and mm -hmm. copies of copies of copies. It's this like postmodern sort of you know, nightmare. Where everything just regurgitates and repeats, and I think that, that drives people mad. Um, and like what I got into on the, on the video about, I mean, one of the things I'll say as well, like I, I, one of the earlier videos I made on music was the one about Ed Sheeran and why I absolutely hated his guts. Like I, I just so despised because I was working at a factory, I was working at a warehouse a few years ago, and, and like they had Ed, Ed Sheeran was on the radio. I heard Ed Sheeran about twenty times a day. On the radio. Oh, oh, he sucks. Yeah. And um <clears throat> and I couldn't really understand why I hated his guts so much. I, and, and like it was it didn't seem rational. And then I realized that it was because he was fake. And what I what I mean by fake is that he he was basically trying to be a rock star from 30 years ago who actually meant it. So it was like a paint by numbers. Yeah. That's definitely true. I mean, like, we, oh, sorry, go ahead. So it, it was as if it was like emotion via a machine. Right. It was just a replica of, of other things. So he, he was like trying to be how he thought a meaningful singer should be rather than just being one. <laughs> That's definitely true. Oh, what a bad review of Ed Sheeran. Poor guy. Poor guy. Although he is um like banging models and stuff, and he's a fat ginger, so I guess it's worked out for him, eh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in terms of like uh, actively avoiding nostalgia, should we really do this? Can we push the nostalgia back even even centuries? Because we're all nostalgic for a bygone era that we that we didn't even live in. Um, and could that help us? Could reminiscing of even further back bygone eras uh, help us resurrect certain elements of it? Everybody gets nostalgic for the 50s. And, I, you know, now that I think that America was uh, never great, I'm like, I, I, I don't have this 50s nostalgia. But but what if we could be nostalgic about uh, romanticism or about the Impressionist period and could uh, draw nostalgia from that? Do you think that that would benefit well us? The romanticism is itself nostalgia for a pre-industrial. <laughs> That's true too. Yeah. It's, it's like before before we got all of these disgusting factories and coal mines and all of it, where the land is beautiful and untouched. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm not I'm not sure. I think 
the, the, the problem that we face, which is something that the mainstream can't address, is how do you get beyond like postmodernism and irony? So um, how, how, do you, how do you actually break through a, a, a sort of a culture which is just always ironic and always sort of dying to just cut the legs away from anybody who is like earnest? Like no, nobody, nobody now can say "I love you" without laughing. Everything, right. everything where, where you want to be earnest and you want to do something and say something meaningful, it's just not possible because it's cringe. Mm. Be, be, being earnest and being serious is cringe, so you can't be. You've always got to have like this sort of half serious kind of mechanism, coping right, mechanism. Right. So, and you, this is all the way like back in the nineties, you know. You just look at stuff like Friends and South Park, because I'm a Gen Xer, and I, I really did that Gen X nomad thing as well, where you just, I mean, I spent like 20 years just wandering around with a rucksack, being a snarky, knowing old prick. <laughs> that, 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 that is like the Gen X, and that's, that really is the Gen X thing. You just you just wander around, like turning your nose up at everything and mm. not taking nothing seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the millennials came in and sort of took everything seriously, of course. To, <laughs> Too but, seriously. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, so so the what you it's as if everybody's thinking, well, how do you get through this this kind of nihilistic postmodernism? Because the mainstream can't. Everything is just I mean, how everything's just dead. It died 20 years ago. And I think you see it in something like um what they call metamodernism, where do you know that meme that you see going around, that yes meme? And it, you do, you take a Vikings cartoon. Oh, head, yeah, yeah. Is, yes. The, that's kind of like, me- so what the, the, the setup of the meme, the joke, which I think it's interesting, is that, you know, you'll have like the bug man, soy face one, and he'll put like a rid- ridiculous sort of, sort of proposition. Like, oh, what, you mean you're going to just marry that girl and then grow tomatoes and carrots in your garden? Like yes. a and then he'll just say yes. <laughs> and so it, it's the, it's That's like the sort of, you know, so it's the postmodernism finally meeting the, the metamodernism. Like, yeah, I, I'm aware of your criticism. I'm aware of, of what you're doing here. I understand it, but I just don't care. I've stepped over it. Yeah. And that, that's that's how you can begin to create new cultural forms. That's true. I mean, that's that's a positive, positive note, perhaps, that we should end on. I mean, that 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 is what we need to be doing and maybe we can put our energies into that into creating more positive forms into renewing our creativity and perhaps we can channel our anger into that i know that there are so many people in our community that have these incredible talents i mean people send me art all the time and and everybody's writing books and i know that this talent exists within us i don't think it's an absence of talent i just think everybody's tired and they just don't know what to do with it and they don't know if it's going to be positively received and people are still inexplicably worried about getting canceled um so maybe that's the key just not worrying about uh, the response yeah. and, and another thing is like the you know what what they what seems to be getting ruled out where you're permanently on the internet like that that is going to be the most unbelievably boring um <laughs> yeah life imaginable mm-hmm. and to the point where i think it'll just be like this systemic breakdown Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was thinking the other day. I was thinking about doing a video on it, but I'll, I'll give you the hot take. <laughs> Do you know the you know the Matrix? Mm-hmm. There was um, if you look into that, I know like this is like super nerdish, and I know I also know like the the problems with the Matrix itself. But in the law, what I think is funny is that the Matrix that we see with uh, Keanu Reeves, like the normal world Matrix, that was actually like the fourth um, incarnation of the Matrix that they had to make. And when you dig into the law, you'll see that they built like three others. And one of them is the paradise one where you, you're, you're kind of, everything was absolutely perfect and you had small communities in dotted like paradise islands. But it was such a perfect fake reality that everybody re- rebelled against it and kind of the whole thing crashed. And so then the architect built another one and they, they, they called it the nightmare Matrix. And it was where... Well, it speaks for itself, and it will be where you were sitting in the fake reality, and the person that you'd been married to for twenty years would like turn into a werewolf or something like this. <laughs> it, 
and not, nothing made sense. Like nothing was logical. Everything was irrational. You would see ghosts and all of this kind of thing. And and I wonder when you see what what the technocrats this like the new transhuman reality like what is is that going to be like the nightmare matrix or will will it be like so much that people just can't stand it and so when when, when you're when you're thinking outside of the box like that um you, you know you, you could they can be looking over at thinking well you know they, they don't have all of the protein shakes and all of the what i've got but they've got like a, a life worth living mm -hmm. and it, it is like a cycle of civilizations that Towards the end, people begin to drift away, uh, drift back to the land, um, and, and I think that we, we one, once you understand this, it it, it begun, begins to be a bit, a bit more of a white pill, you know. That's true. And the because, pressure because, is kind of off to save to save Western civilization now. Because you, you, you're, it's like oh well, we've got like this amount of time, and we've got this, you know, it's panic, 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 panic. But like, do you really want to be in that 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 ship when it when it goes down? Um, is is the question? No, I mean, to some degree, it's impossible to divorce yourself from yeah. society, and especially in America, we're we're never going to be left alone. Like, I I live in North Idaho, and it's just this influx of progressive Californians moving to this white era area with um, no self awareness uh, about why California sucks or diversity. And then they just come here and they're like, Oh, it's so great. I can leave my car unlocked. But it's like, why, why do you think it's like this? Um, so it is, it is kind of cyclical that we're just going to be pushed into different areas of the country. And like, I, I'm just not going to move anymore. I'm not, I'm not doing yeah. that. Um, but I will resist to the best of my ability. And, and I think that you're right that moving towards an agrarian society is really our only option for um, authenticity and authentic living and, and spirituality the, as well. Yeah. I mean, one of the things, I mean, there is that, that one of the, one of the, again, like just to be optimistic is that there are nationalist networks, which exist with mm -hmm. tens of thousands of people um, already, already, like already, you know, like forming little book clubs and ways they can they can um, get each other, like tea and and all of this, um, and so this is already beginning to happen. And I think <clears throat> if if pressure's off, where you're going to take on the entire system, if you like, if you've accepted that, it's, you're just going to get banned. You'll just be deplatformed and probably arrested. Um, then then you think, okay, then let's just settle in for the long haul. Right. And make sure that we're all right. So these networks already exist. So it isn't like all doom and gloom. It's, you know, just take care. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, <laughs> that was my guest, Morgoth. It's been... Um highly anticipated and people have been requesting you to come on for quite a while. So it was so lovely to talk to you. And if you just want to give everybody um, a little rundown on where to find you, that would be great. Um, well, Morgoth's review on um, YouTube, on Odyssey, um, and um, Morgoth's review on Telegram. I'm banned from Twitter. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. you, your, yours was, I remember yours being like one of the first. You were like a fan oh, yeah. of Twitter ban. It was 2017 and I got banned. Yep. Yet I'm still on YouTube. It makes me think I'm not talking about anything important. It's inexplicable to me that I haven't been banned on here. Maybe you'll be the one that did it for my channel. Yeah, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't think the algorithm understands what I'm saying. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. Um, anyway, thanks so much for coming on. And thank yes. you, live chat, for, for joining us. We really appreciate it. All right. Cheers. See you Bye, later. Guys.